Welcome everybody to St. Aidan's Orthodox Church Bible Study and for the reconvening of this meeting, of course, after Great Lent and the celebrations of Pascha. Uh, those of you who are watching who are not Orthodox will still perhaps appreciate the acclamation that we all give at Easter time, whether we're East or West, Christ is risen and the response, indeed, he is risen, or if you will, he is risen indeed. But we'll start with uh, the indeed. Uh, acclamation. I know that we have here the possibility of two other languages at least. I don't know whether Sabine, oh yes, yeah, Sabine making it three with German. Uh, do you know any Gallic? Do you know the Gallic um, translation? No. Of I don't but you know. know. But you know the German, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So um, we welcome those of who are watching this and listening to this um later on as a recording on youtube so we will make the easter acclamation first of all in english then in romanian then in greek then in german okay i think we've got all the languages there haven't we right christ is risen indeed he is risen <laughs> oh we nearly got there okay all together christ is risen Indeed, he is risen. This is risen. In Greek, Martha. Christos Anesti. Alithos Anesti. Alithos Anesti. Excellent. Maruna. Christos Anviat. Advarat Anviat. Apologies about the pronunciation. And Sabine, German, please. Yeah. Christus is auferstanden. I er don't know what Christ 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 Christ. Christ. Er ist wahrhaft auferstanden. Er ist wahrhaft auferstanden. Ah, we've got Maruna there. That's excellent. We're more than one person with German. That's brilliant. Okay. So that's great. So shall we begin? Uh, we're carrying on with the kind of epilogue of the fig tree where we left off um, in Great Lent. And then moving on. So we're on Mark chapter 11. Uh, beginning to read at verse 22. So the first five verses, please. Uh, we're including verse 26. More about that in a moment. Uh, over to you, Simon Peter, if you would read, please. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Right. OK, I mentioned verse 26. It's in... Uh, square brackets there and in italic that's because the earliest uh, manuscripts of the new testament do not contain this verse and in fact if you look in many um modern english translations the numbering strangely goes from 25 to 27 uh 26 of course is given here it is in some later manuscripts but many new testament scholars believe it to be a later goose. um no less than scripture, of course, if you include it, but it's not necessary. Uh, well, it's conventionally not included in, in most Bibles. But of course, it's teaching uh, is fully uh, compatible with and really just really repeats verse 25, uh, the, the second part of it. Um, so uh, the character and nature of faith. Now, of course, is this hyperbole moving mountains or is it a realistic prospect? Do you know there's a, there's a Coptic account of a saint in the Coptic church that uh, was a great man of faith and exercised his faith and told the mountain to move. And in the Coptic tradition, uh, they've even located it in Egypt and said, this is where the mountain came to rest and this is where it started. So what are we dealing with here? Hyperbole or a literal, uh, and well, a teaching of a possible literal event? Who 
We'll start with the big question, not with the small. <laughs> Welcome to Daniel joining us uh, in our Bible study. We're looking at Mark chapter 11 and verses 22 to 26. It, it has the sense of hyperbole, doesn't it? It's mm -hmm. what's saying you can achieve great things, amazing things by faith in God. The scriptures in somewhere in the Old Testament, I forget which now, talk about the, the sun being stopped in its tracks for a time. Uh, could we have faith so as to manipulate even stars? Everybody's very quiet. <laughs> it's not a test of faith to say yes rather than no, this is hyperbole. What do we think is going on here? Over to you. Go on, Simon. You've you you've read. You speak. Go on. Be um, brave. Be brave. Yeah, I think it is meant figuratively. The mountain part itself. Yeah. Um, it, it's used to give an example. Uh, um. Yeah. I don't think you lose anything by saying it's hyperbole because it's like a figure of speech to the effect that powerful prayer can achieve, we might put in brackets, almost anything. Mm. I mean, there were limitations on prayer. We don't pray for bad things to happen. You know, we, we don't pray uh, that suddenly we should all be able to walk on water and it's a kind of... Um, test of being a true believer in the walk in water walk on water church which we might call it uh that you could only be a member of this church the walk on water church if you could actually walk on water that would be ridiculous and we would necessarily limit the the reach of prayer uh as not including things that are bad or uh showing off or simply, you know, a, a kind of, yeah, kind of an amazing event just to wow people, that wouldn't really be authentic prayer, would it? Mm. Prayer, prayer and faith reinforce each other. But we can expect great things from God. I think there's a plaque in Westminster Abbey somewhere, um, which I remember seeing when I was young, and it says, expect great things of God. Are we, are we, yes. I mean, the rest of us are silent, but I mean, are, are we warming to that theme? We're letting hyperbole encourage us to claim great things and wonderful things for the betterment of the human species, for our own salvation, and to encourage others to faith. But it's not like praying for anything to happen, is it? Please speak to me. No. <laughs> David, what do you think? Come on. I, I think it's got a certain hyperbole. <clears throat> I mean, Christ it's about if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Yeah. Hyperbole is not a cause of self mutilation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the model of it being hyperbolic is, is perfectly reasonable. Mm. Let's move on. Now, there's something here which is prof very spiritually very profound, but we must put a certain degree of caution around it, and I'll explain why in a moment. He, but sorry, just a moment. Be remember, okay. But does not doubt in his heart. Jesus, remember when he heals, um, the the boy who has fits. You know, his father brings him to him. He throws him into the fire. He foams at his mouth. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. That is from God's knowledge of a person who says that. Pleasing to him and an article of faith itself to say, Lord, make up any deficit of my faith by your graciousness, by your love, by your power. Help thou my unbelief. Help me to bring me to the fullness of faith. That is a God-pleasing cry. 
in any situation. So it's not as if Jesus is saying you've got to have absolutely no doubt in your heart whatsoever for your prayers to be answered. But it is an encouragement to deal with the doubt that we have so that we can gradually, perhaps, but make progress in having confidence in God. I mean, if we're going to have confidence in God, surely it ought to be 100% confidence in God. If we're not going to have 100% confidence in God, allowing for our weakness, but, you know, aspirationally, perhaps we might say, what are we about if we're not having total confidence in God? What we have less confidence in is our ability to discern the things for which we ought rightly to pray. We might then say we do not have confidence in our own insights. Trust in the Lord. Rely not on your own insight. You know, commit your ways to him. You know, I'm paraphrasing, aren't I? Um, Psalm? think some or is it probably can't just things come to my head and i can't locate them um, um, immediately so trusting god means that we have confidence in him 100 percent confidence but we also allow for the fact that we may not be praying aright but if we do have confidence in god and it is a good thing jesus goes on to say believe that you received them and you will have them. In other words, it's almost like a down payment of faith to say, I'm having faith for this situation and I'm believing that it will come to pass in accordance with God's will. And this is my attitude as I pray, not praying. Well, I'm not sure really, Lord, whether you want to do this really or not. Well, I mean, obviously, none of us are really sure. But, you know, so therefore I'll pray with ifs and buts and maybes. Jesus doesn't want us to pray with ifs and buts and maybes. And if we make a mistake of judgment, then we will learn from our mistake. But it shouldn't dent our confidence in God. It just means we've got to learn for our lack of discernment in that case. And putting these cautionary notes around it in relation to our own discernment because i think there are pentecostal traditions that take these texts and say i'm gonna faith it i'm gonna claim it i'm gonna believe it's already happened without realizing that there can be hubris in this prelest i mean all the different words that the orthodox use for pride there can be a, a kind of arrogance about it telling God what to do because we've already judged what we should pray for and our confidence in praying for it. You know, I mean, we can have confidence in God, but at the same time, we must have humility in the very act of prayer itself. It's a combination, therefore, I think, of both humility and confidence. Not, not, not confidence and arrogance, not humility and vacillation of, you know, not really being sure with all our buts and ifs and maybes. It's a difficult balance to maintain when we pray. But in our relationship with God, the humility always comes first. But then the confidence in his promises must come very quickly afterward. I'm sorry I've spoken for quite a long time about that, but it's a complex and deep issue in relation to faith and prayer. Any observations, please? I think the um, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief is a perfect encapsulation of that, both confidence and humility. It is, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Why do we have confidence in God? I mean, I know it seems a very disarming, simple question. But why do we have confidence in God? We can be sceptical as to ourselves, but we're never sceptical as to God. Hasn't he shown himself to be worthy of our trust? 
by what he has done, by the liberation of the children of Israel from the slavery and grip of Pharaoh, that great exodus, that great promise attendant upon it to enter the promised land, the promise of the Messiah, did he not come? The promise of God concerning of our salvation, and was that not achieved and bitterly upon the cross? Surely we have grounds for confidence in God. But when we deal with folk who don't have confidence in God, what we need to do is to take that data, as it were, from the scriptures and the tradition of the church and the lives of the saints and say, look, you can have confidence in the Lord. These did. These people tasted and saw that the Lord was good. So it's then be it then becomes an invitation. The journey of faith becomes an invitation to a closer walk and a deeper trust. And that goes for all of us because we all doubt and we all have those wobble moments. And particularly when we're facing some personal affliction or some conflict or some dread or some existential thing in our lives. But we have to keep coming back to the trustworthiness of God. That's upon, That's the data upon which our trust is based. It's not kind of whistling in the wind or just uh, casting a few um, aspirations and notions of trust. It's, it's really trusting God. But even in the circumstances of our life that can be really challenging, he has his will and his purpose for us. I don't know whether anybody's got any... Uh, personal examples of that concerning the trustworthiness of God and not necessarily a situation of uh, uh, affliction, but maybe just simply one where prayer and faith have helped us to navigate uh, situations, find out what the Lord requires of us. And then we found that, well, yeah, that truly was through the power of prayer and through faith and something wonderful was achieved. You know the story about the the uh, acquisition of uh, the building of St. Aidan's, don't you? No. Thank you, Daniel. No. <laughs> uh, I, I finally got it working. <laughs> oh what the what the the the, the, the uh, webcam you mean? Yeah, and the audio. I couldn't get it working. Every but I have to just oh. download the app. So out cold. <laughs> oh, you're brilliant! You you yes, you <laughs> can hear you loud and clear, Daniel. No, we were, we were we needed our own building. We were uh, um, a small group of uh, probably about twenty twenty five persons back in nineteen ninety. 596 we were not long established as an orthodox mission and um we needed our own building we were very happily accommodated by um the deaf and blind center at uh, walthew house in stockport who were very generous and supportive of, of of us but we were having to put everything up and take everything down for every every set of services over a weekend and it was tiring and anybody who has, do, has done this in a mission will know. And, you know, the, the Orthodox don't exactly travel light. So all the stuff that's got to be put up and taken down, it really is quite challenging. Yeah, and, I can um, imagine. Yes. Yeah. I mean, not, not not everything that we've got now at St. Aidan's, you know, that's been, a, that's yeah, been yeah. together over many, many years. But anyway, it was so we prayed about it and we said, well, well let's see what the Lord has for us. And then one of our number, a lady called Dwinwood, she lives in the south now near her daughter, um, saw a very small ad in the classified section of the Manchester Evening News. And it said, church hall for sale, um, offers to whatever it was, telephone number, and by such and such a date, it was 10 days hence. Offers, uh, I, can't, I don't think they specified what well, they just said, offers gratefully received, whatever. So we said, right, what we're going to do? So we we had a look at it uh, ex externally, 
and um, then the following Sunday, a few days later, uh, I said, right, well, let's pray about it. Uh, and uh, we'll we'll talk, you know, over the phone about what we should um, make an offer for and what we could raise ourselves through prayer. I, I then did the practical thing of approaching the Royal Bank of Scotland and asked them for a business term loan, which quite remarkably, and again, it's a miracle they granted, um, we offered 40,000 for it. And um, I got a loan for 28 and the congregation raised 12 grand in 10 days. Oh, nice one. And there was, that, you that's know, pretty cheap, really, if you think about it. Imagine if you try and get it these days. <laughs> and we got it. And we got oh, the bill. That's great news. So, you know, those people who prayed to discern the right place and who had faith and sacrificed for it. Um, you know, everything that's been achieved in and through that building for the kingdom of God over the last 30 years, 29 years, 28, we got it in 1996 in June, um, is down to the faith that the people had at that time, that they believed that God was trustworthy, that if he wanted to have a place, he would provide it, provided we did our bit as well. Amen. So we had confidence in God. And, you know, over and in our personal lives, I'm sure we've all, in different ways, tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And that yeah. there is our confidence. Now, what about um, verse 25? What realism does Jesus bring to this uh, act of faith in relation to our integrity as Christians, as disciples of Christ? And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Echoing, of course, our Lord's Prayer. We'll look at verse 26 in a moment. So, if we're going to have faith, if we're going to pray with confidence, we've also got to live the prayer, and we've also got to be sure that we're praying with a pure heart. This is where I think some of the excess uh, of some Christian traditions, thinking that anything they ask for, they're going to get has to be tempered by an attitude of mind and life that is living the Christian life. If we're living it, if we're daily converting ourselves, if we're daily repenting, uh, if we're forgiving those who have wounded us, uh, if we're living the authentic Christian life, then that immeasurably strengthens our prayer. But don't expect prayer to be answered if we're not praying with we've mentioned that humility that basic repentant heart which we must never lose sight of because insofar as we've known the mercy of god for our own sins we will unlike the unjust steward be merciful in respect to those who sin against us quite reasonable isn't it reasonable yeah. but not always easy yeah, because sometimes it can be hard, but I've I've noticed like um, basically when you're forgiving others, basically it's um uh, it's for you as well because obviously you you're holding a burden, then it just like brings pain up on you. If you forgive that person, then you un unloving that burden off yourself as well. Yes. Everybody's burdens get lifted, you know. Yeah, yeah. St. Paul said, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Mm. The law of Christ being love, of course. Amen. Amen. As I say, verse 26 is uh, not in the earliest manuscripts. And in many uh, copies of the New Testament, verse 26 is omitted. It's uh, inserted here because it is in later manuscripts. 
uh, it is no less scripture insofar as it teaches um, much the same thing as verse 25, doesn't it? And it calls in accordance with the Lord's Prayer. Um, Martha, there is an absolutely wonderful passage now from St. John Chrysostom. It's, I mean, it just blows me away. I'm sure it will each one of us. Could you read it for us, please, yeah, Mark? Yeah. So the power of prayer. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Just fine. Yeah. yeah, okay. So the power of prayer, Chrysostom. Chrysostom. Prayer is all efficient, manoply, a, a treasure undiminished, a mind never exhausted, a sky un unobstructed by clouds, a haven unruffled by storm. It is the root, the fountain, and the mother of a thousand blessings. It exceeds a monarch's power. I speak not of the prayer which is cold and feeble and devoid of zeal. I speak of that which proceeds from a mind outstretched, the child of a contrite spirit, the offspring of a soul converted. This is the prayer which mounts to heaven. The power of prayer has subdued the strength of fire, bridled the rage of lions, silenced anarchy, ex extinguished wars, appeased the elements, expelled demons, burnt the chains of death, enlarged the gates of heaven, relieved uh, diseases, averted frauds, rescued cities from destruction, stayed the sun in its course and arrested the progress of the thunderbolt. In some, prayer has power to destroy whatever is it uh, is at enmity with the good. I speak not of the prayer of the lips, but of the prayer that ascends from the inmost recesses of the heart on the comprehensible nature of uh, God, homilies 5, 44, 46, 57, 58. Yeah. Unbelievable, yeah. That's I mean, it. that's where Chrysostom comes into his own and, and worthily, uh, deserves the title in Greek Chrysostomos, mm -hmm. uh, the golden mouth, because of his preaching and his teaching. And he has all that conviction that a God honoring prayer is one that comes from our viscerally, from the very center of our being, with all our faculties, mind and heart engaged. And of course, a will to fulfill the will of God that might arise out of the prayer. Be careful what you pray for. Uh, George Herbert uh, wrote a wonderful prayer, uh, short poem on prayer. Uh, I might, it's, it's, it's not as long as Chrysostom, but it has a similar grandeur. Um, I'll just bring it up for you. Um, you know about George Herbert? No. Mm -hmm. He was... Um, just after the Reformation, uh, really during the period of Queen Elizabeth I, he was a country parson. Uh, he died in, I think, his early 40s um, of a cons consumptive disease. Um, but in that brief period of ministry, in his late 30s, he, um, I mean, he's just extraordinary. He toiled for his flock. He was a true priest, you know, okay? He wasn't orthodox, but his heart and his mind I believe, just like many, such as C.S. Lewis and others, uh, was deeply orthodox. And this is it. And if you don't mind, I'll read it because uh, I just love it so. Prayer, the church's banquet, angel's age, God's breath in man returning to his birth, the soul in paraphrase, heart in pilgrimage, the Christian plummet sounding heaven and earth, Engine against the Almighty, sinner's tower, reverse thunder, Christ side piercing spear, the six days world transposing in an hour, a kind of tune which all things hear and fear, softness and peace and joy and love and bliss, exalted manner, gladness of the best, heaven in ordinary, man well dressed, the Milky Way, the bird of paradise. Church bells beyond the stars heard, the soul's blood, the land of spices, something understood. I think, 
you know, we really do need poetry when it comes to um, such excellent theology as this. Because poetry manages to encapsulate more than just simple sequential logical sentence construction can because it brings together you know heaven in ordinary that means everything that is not ordinary and, and normal to our lives becomes radiant and, and splendid in the holy spirit you know heaven in ordinary man well dressed god wants us to dress us with the virtues with the glory of his kingdom he doesn't want us to be naked in our isolation all of that is encapsulated in a poem and of course in Chrysostom's wonderful wonderful um piece there John Cassian David read please for us John Cassian I'll just magnify the screen a bit right okay uh, yeah. right. while we are praying there should be no hesitation that would intervene or break down the confidence of our attention of our petition by any shadow of despair. We know that by pouring forth our prayer, we are, are obtaining already what we are asking for. We have no doubt that our prayers have effectively reached God, for to that degree that one believes that he is regarded by God and that God can grant it, just so far one will be heard and obtain an answer. Yeah, so this is basically... John Cassian, who, by, by the way, is one of the early pioneers of monasticism uh, in the West, getting this from Egypt, uh, essentially. John Cassian here is really offering us a, a neat little um, meditation on what we've just heard in the gospel, that we should pray with confidence. OK, so moving on, Mark 11, 27 to 33. Daniel, uh, would you read, please, this passage for us? And then, then they... not people who have not read can do the patristic commentaries afterwards. Sorry, Daniel, carry on. No worries. Then they came again to Jerusalem, and he said, was walking into the temple. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him, and they said to him, By what authority are you doing? these things and who gave you this authority to do these things but jesus answered and said to them i also will ask you one question then answer me and i will tell you by what authority i do these things the the baptism of john was was it from heaven or from man Answer me. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then do you not believe him? But if we say from man, they fear the people, for all accounted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus answered and said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Daniel. No so, here they are. Jesus' uh, opposition, for want of a better word, those who distrust him, those who would rather see him gone. And they're trying to, once again, they're trying to trap him. Remember, when later on in the narrative before the Passion, they say, oh, you know, who should we be, Caesar or God? You know, they're flipping the coin, you know, I'm trying to trap, always trying to trap him. And of course, he is, Jesus is the wisdom of God. So he ain't going to be trapped. And this is part of their arrogance that they think they can trap him with a, a double-edged sword of a question. And of course, explain, it's explained here because if John's baptism is authentic and therefore from heaven, then they undermine their own position. But if they say it's from men, then they lose favor with the people. So actually the question um, is very panelly set 
this time by Jesus. Okay? Because he turns the table on them. He asks them a, a tricky question. Okay? So he plays them at their own game. So they say, we do not know. It's a bit like when it's a bit like when Jesus sets a trap for the lawyer, you know, when he comes and uh, uh, and tells him the parable of the Good Samaritan. Who then was the neighbor of the man who was set among thieves? And of course, the lawyer cannot bring himself to say the Samaritan because he's a heretic. I mean, for Jews, Samaritans are heretics. So he says the one who helped him. And here, of course, they say, well, we don't know. We don't know the answer to that question. And Jesus says, right, well, I'm not going to tell you either. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. What does this teach us about how we should answer tricky questions or how we might set tricky questions to unmask people's motives? I mean, it's the second one that we're talking about here because the trickery of the scribes and the Pharisees is turned against them. It's not a trick, really. I mean, it's a legitimate question. The baptism of John, was it authentic or not? But what do we learn from this encounter concerning those who do not ask with an honest heart? Those who ask from a position of trickery and of mistrust and opposition. Do we feel that we have to give an answer as Christians? No, not really. Sometimes you don't like that. Like, if you just done what Jesus done then and basically, like, reversed it, reversed it back onto them, then you, you're more likely to find out their true motives of the situation, yeah. what they're implying. Yeah, mm. it unmasks the true motivation mm. of the of the the people who are, you're dealing with, doesn't it? Yes. Mm. Yeah, because so, they're not the the chief priests and such. They're not lacking intellectually. They think they have a logical trap for him, and then they also recognize when they are themselves caught in a logical trap, but what they lack is faith and courage, and they don't have the courage of their own conviction to even answer the question. They just bow out, basically. Yeah. Because they think, with their in initial tricky question concerning verse 28, by what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you these authority? They want Jesus to step right forward and saying, I'm doing my Father's will. Hmm. But he doesn't answer the plain truth, he bounces the tricky question back on them. And actually, it's really focused. Jesus's response is focused on the evidence, not on some sort of theoretical notion. Is John's baptism authentic? Well, look to the reception by the people. The reception by the people is more important, actually, than the opinion of the religious elders. Mm. You know, on, on the topic of whether we should have to answer people who ask us questions, we're also told to not cast our pearls before swine, aren't we? Yes, in this exactly. manner. Exactly. Yeah. So we have to discern by the grace and wisdom of the Holy Spirit, whether someone is receptive to what we may have to offer them. If they're not receptive, then it's best to keep keep things into our, keep things to our heart. Isn't I mean, there's an old English proverb, there ain't you, you snock, or is that an American? I don't know, there ain't you snocking when nobody's in, you know, I mean, <laughs> you... You're, you're only going to actually make progress with people if there is a basic receptivity. So that means there needs to be a listening to them, um, a dialogue, yeah, for sure. But you don't get into the deeper things of God unless, you, unless you're sure that the person in front of you is serious-minded. They may be full of doubts, 
They may have skepticisms galore, but if they have a true and honest heart and they want to know more and they're not just trying to play you, once you've discerned that, then you can start opening that box of pearls. But until you do, you don't open the box of pearls. So it's just not true, as some Christians suppose, that the gospel is just some sort of like water cannon and you just aim it everywhere and you hope that a few people pick it up, you know. Hmm. We're not using water cannons. We're bringing springs of living water to those who are thirsty. You know what the Baptist preacher Spurgeon said, again, completely orthodox in what he said concerning preaching. He said, uh, I think it was about evangelism, actually. He said, evangel well, I'll, I'll start it that way. I'm trying to remember exactly what he said. Evangelism is one beggar telling another where to find bread. But if people say, oh, no, 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 I, I know everything there is to know about religions, don't you know? I, I, I've I studied Christianity for a long time, and I think so, a lot of its uh, uh, practical manifestations are entirely to be lauded. And uh, I think Jesus is a very attractive figure. Yes, well, people can be have that dilettante interest in Jesus, which never really gets deeply into the issue of the human condition. And what is needful in order to remedy it in our hearts and our lives. And that will always involve repentance. You can't just slide into Christianity because it's yet another interesting philosophy. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake, for they shall be filled, to quote from uh, the Beatitudes. Maruna and Sabine, I think you are the only ones who have not read. Um, fearing the truth, Maruna, please read for us from Augustine. Right. So fearing a stoning, but fearing more an admission of the truth, they answered the truth with a lie, reminiscent of the scripture. Injustice has lied within herself. That's a quote from the scripture. For they said, quote, we know not, end of quote. And because they had shut themselves up against him by asserting that they did not know what they knew, the Lord did not open up to them because they did not knock. For it has been said, a quote, knock and it will be opened to you, end of quote. But they not only had not knocked that it may be opened, but by their denial they barricaded the door itself against themselves. And the Lord said to them, quote, neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things, end of quote. Yeah. You know the famous painting by William Holman Hunt of Christ, the light of the world, and Jesus with the lantern is standing outside the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, quoting from Revelation, you know. And obviously referencing from the gospel, seek and you will find knock on the door shall be open to you. And the, the handle to the door, I think we've talked about this before, is on the inside, on our side. And it is our privilege by grace to open the door. But if we barricade as augustine says here if we barricade the door by being duplicitous duplicitous or dishonest or not really wanting the answer that we suspect might indeed be true because we can't face the consequences of that answer being given to us and therefore we barricade the door against christ coming in then we have made a choice that god i will not say must honor but that God invariably does honour because he doesn't override our free will. There are such as Paul, formerly Saul, that the Lord sees as capable of amendment of life, out of a revolution of life, in fact, such that he will become apostle to the Gentiles. So not all those who barricade the door are going to have the door permanently barricaded. But indeed, sadly, some do. Sadly, some do. 
So the box of pearls, to mix all these metaphors, the box of pearls has to remain firmly shut. Some Christians, of course, find it very difficult not to open the box of pearls because they think that Jesus is so wonderful, everybody ought to have him. And, of course, it's very often counterproductive. So effective evangelism is always manifesting a life which is attractive and sometimes speaking words of God prophetically to someone, but only when they are ready to hear. And now for verse 33, we've got a quote from Bede. Bede the Venerable, as called in the West, but in the Orthodox East, he is the Orthodox Western Saint, and we call him Saint, St. Bede of Jarrow. Uh, not himself, uh, I believe, what we would now call a Geordie, but he ended up there. Okay, so Sabine, could you read this uh, commentary from Bede, please? Yes. Um, it is as if Jesus had said, I will not tell you what I know, since you will not confess what you know. In this way, knowledge is hidden from those who wrongly seek it, principally for two reasons. First, when the one who seeks it does not have sufficient capacity to understand what he's seeking for. And second, when through contempt for the truth, one is unworthy of having the subject of his inquiry explained to him. So these critics were most, were most justly set aback. They were treated in disgrace. Expositions on the Gospels of Mark. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? I mean, you know, Bede is often so lucid, so clear. And so fair, because in the first category, those who do not have the sufficient capacity to understand, they are blameless. They're not in disgrace. They just simply don't have the capacity to understand. When Aidan was sent on his mission from Iona to, uh, again, to the northeast, he was to replace a monk who had formerly gone there, who came back disgusted that the people were so heathen and uncouth, they couldn't possibly um, receive the gospel. And quite wisely, the community in Iona, St. Aidan, because he was a humble man and realised that they didn't have the capacity to receive what the other monk, whose they are now forget, was bringing to them. This monk evangelist who preceded him. But when Aidan went there, he took simple, straightforward words that were capable of being understood. He gave them, as it were, spiritual milk. Not something too rich, not spiritual meat before they were ready. So that's fine. That's OK. We can deal with that. But for those, the second group who through content from the, for the truth are unworthy of having the subject of inquiry explained to them, putting it in third person plural. Those are the ones who we must leave to God's providence and grace and leave well alone. So in order to have a godly conversation with someone, which might have the character of dialogue or something much more challenging, we do need to discern in the Holy Spirit whether that person or that group or even that nation is yet as yet ready to hear. Many of us who have told on the mission years for mission field for many years made some progress until COVID. And then since COVID, Many more doors have been opened, particularly amongst Generation Z. You all know the story of what's been happening across many churches, not just the Orthodox Church, but those particularly who have had a more, uh, what shall we say, faithfulness to the apostolic tradition. But we've certainly seen it in the Orthodox Church that doors are really opening all over the place. Doors that we've neither oiled whose hinges we've neither oiled nor doors that we've not painted nor had any engagement with whatsoever. But the, the Holy Spirit is doing something quite wonderful at the moment. And this society, this culture in the West, far from being deprived and utterly uh, despairing of God, is now, I believe, beginning to turn again to its first love. It may take a few hundred years, but the, the turning has begun.
All right, question. Shut me up anyway, just to wrap this thing up. <laughs> how do we how do we discern whether somebody is ready or not, either through capacity or through genuineness and sincerity of heart? How do we discern whether or not these folk are ready? With their understanding and knowledge, I would say. Uh-huh. Could you say a bit more, Daniel? Give like, example. basically, like, because with, with me, you see, I'm new to Orthodox, but, like, I've been, like, doing a lot of reading and researching and watching, like, certain things, like, on YouTube, but you're never going to get better actually going to a church than, yes. than getting to know the thing. That's why I'm, I'm looking to get, like, an in introduction book because I've got a, uh, what, what's it called? What's it called now? The the religion of the apostles. What I'm reading at the moment. All oh, right. Yes, I know it. Yes. Yeah, it's an amazing book. So, um, I'm getting more like into that sense. Plus, reading my Bible as well. But since since like, it's a funny story actually because I'm reading the Book of Acts at the moment in my Orthodox study Bible. Then, as I'm reading the notes, then I'm like, ha. How I've because I came from a Protestant background and now I'm reading it from here, it's like, how was he ever Protestant? <laughs> <laughs> when you're reading the notes and it just like all lines up together on uh, the book of Acts, then it, it's 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 crazy. So yeah. It all it all falls into place, doesn't it? I can remember this myself. I mean it all it, falls it, into place. It really does, and that's how I felt at the moment, like I'm a baby again. Oh. <laughs> it does, it feels like it. But the, the Protestant tradition introduced you to Jesus and took you a long way. And I yeah, think definitely. It's, it's positive to be thankful to God for that and to, to realise that what orthodoxy does is just shuffle it round and make sure it all makes a proper sense and puts it on a solid footing. I think that my, and that's how I see it. I think, yeah. I mean, I thank God for my time in the Church of England um, you know, initially in an evangelical uh, uh, milieu and then later in a more Anglo-Catholic one, I had a big experience and on the way through charismatic renewal. So I had a big experience in the Anglican church for which I, I thank God because it showed me the diversity of gifts that are possible within a Christian community. And then I fell in love with orthodoxy and I thought, oh, hang on a minute. Um, you know, the Anglican tradition is not going to be able to help me make sense of this, but orthodoxy does. And that's yeah. when I started to, you know, that's when I started to move on. But knowing what we need ourselves, I think, is the grace of the Holy Spirit. And if we pray and if we read and if we act as a disciple, then, uh, you know, that that's um, a wonderful thing, really, in our lives. And I always say to people, you never say, oh, I wish I had your faith. You know I'm going to say what I'm going to say now. Those of you have heard me say this countless times before. When somebody says, oh, I wish I had your faith, please remind them that in the Bible, faith is not something you have. It's something you do. You faith it. It's a verb. It's not like a, you know, it's not like a, a full bag of shopping. Oh, dear, my bag's empty. No, mm. it's something you do. And in the doing of it, it grows. Amen. Yes. Anything more to wrap up before uh, we say cheerio until God willing the next time? Well, I, I want to thank you. Oh yeah, one thing I need to ask you. What one second? Is that beneficial to bring to church? Oh yes, of course. Yes, because like most of the prayers are in here. Then sometimes, like because I use it all the time, it's, then I'm like, what sections do we use? Like when I'm in like church and stuff like that sort of sense. Yeah, I think what you need to do, Daniel, is um, I normally say to people, don't take away the service books. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, in your case, I'll make an exception. You know, right. you come to Danes, whatever, help yourself. To, we've got an evening prayer on, a matins morning prayer on, and we've got the Eucharist, we've got the liturgy. 
So I think it can be sometimes useful to get really familiar with the words of the services. Um, yeah. Of course, the book you've got there has a lot more material than you will encounter um, on any given weekend or any given day. But as you become more familiar, when you hear them yeah. in the service, you'll think, oh, I'm using that. Or I read that the other week, you know. Yeah, you because that's what, you build that's up what I was with... like. That's yeah. what I was like last week. Then I thought, should I bring me book? Then I thought, because like, so most of the prayers and stuff like that are in here. And I was looking looking through them on the Sunday, like, I'm sure that was in service. And because, like, sometimes it's like I'm forgetting the words and it's like everyone it'll, knows it'll, the words. It'll come. <laughs> it'll come in due time. Yeah. It'll come, you know. It's like building up a vocabulary of prayer. You, it's important yeah. to still use your own words, but then just yeah. like memorising scripture, which is a good thing to do, things come back to you and you think, oh, yeah, and, and something clicks. Yeah. I'm sure that's been the experience of all of us here in different ways. All right, everybody. Well, um, moving on to Mark 12 next week, God willing. So same time, same place. And thank you to all of us who have contributed here. Thank you to those of you who will be uh, watching and listening to this uh, later on on YouTube. And uh, God bless. And uh, Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. 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 And good night, and have a good rest of the day yeah. to you all. Take care. Bye you for too. now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Father. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.